Are we all well? Can everybody see me? Can everybody hear me? Please tell me that you can. I hope everything is going to run smoothly in the wonderful world of virtual events. I mean, feel free to chuck it in the chat box if you're struggling to hear me or struggling to see me. But good evening, everybody, and welcome to Headliners 2022. My name is Leah Davis. I will be your host for this evening. And we're, we're in for a proper treat, you know. We've got some amazing authors to chat to. And you've already done something amazing by being a part of this and by buying a ticket, because as I'm sure you know, uh, the proceeds of the event tonight are going to support Arts Emergency. They are an amazing charity that give young people access to the arts and to humanities. What they're doing right now is just invaluable. Now more than ever, we need people like them. So nice one, guys. You can feel good about that. And uh, just as a reminder, while we are geeking out over these amazing authors, please feel free to jump on your socials and use the hashtag headliners2022. Uh, we can all get chatting and have a little gossip on Twitter as well. I'm pretty sure last time we did this, we were trending, so no pressure, but if we can break the internet, that would definitely be appreciated. Uh, what else do we need to know for tonight? Oh yeah, you can drop any questions that you've got in the chat. If we have time at the end, I'm sure our wonderful authors will uh, would love to answer your questions and to chat to you. But without further ado, I think it is time for us to get started. Uh, our first panel of the evening, uh, we are calling New Voices. I am going to be joined by three amazing young authors, Bolly Babalola, Radhika Sangani, and Nell Hudson. Good evening, ladies. Good evening. How are you, Leah? Good, good. How are you? Great, thank you. Good. Nell, how are you feeling? Yeah, really good. Thank you. Very happy to be here. How are you? Yeah, yeah, feeling good. And Radhika, how are you? Good, thanks. It's Radhika. Radhika, Radhika. My bad. Sorry. I'm so glad you called me out on that. That is, that would have just been too shameful, Radhika. I can't. <laughs> but welcome. You are officially the new voices, uh, according to headlines. So, you know, no pressure. But I'm um, starting with you, Lalu. This is amazing. Your, your previous book, your first book, a collection of love stories, which you already know I loved. Love in Colour was incredible. And your highly anticipated first novel, Honey and Spice, is to be published in the summer. Talk to yes. us about Kiki Banjo, your amazing protagonist, and what makes her a main character for the modern age. Oh my gosh, I adore Kiki because she's so, I know this word is bandied about a lot, but she really is unapologetically her. Um, she's sharp-tongued and she's really soft-hearted at the same time. And what I love about her is that she's so open to her growth um she allows herself to be vulnerable and to the journey she goes through in in the book and I think so so much of the time we're not allowed to be strong and soft at the same time and what Honey and Spice celebrates is our ability um to be that to do all that and to be loved for who we are fully and what I love about Kiki is that even though she goes through these ups and downs within her confidence who she is, like deep down, is never in question. She knows who she is and she's proud of who she is. Um, and this kind of this immutable knowledge of the fact that she's frankly the shit. And I think <laughs> it's a confidence that I think I, I love to see in my, my rom-com protagonist. And I think that Kiki has it in spades. I actually really look up to her. her. It's like my characters on, honestly take on like a life of their own. And they tell me about myself, which is... Um, an interesting experience, but one I'm very grateful for. Amazing. I mean, it's always handy when you can learn something from your protagonist. I yeah. think we should maybe all be a bit more kiki, right? <laughs> I think so. I definitely could stand to be a bit more kiki. Hey, <laughs> and right. um, Radhika, your novel, 30 Things I Love About Myself, is original, it's hilarious, it's refreshing, and unusually as well, it's sort of, it's celebrating the joys of being single and being on your own, but not necessarily lonely. Um, I think one of the signalers of its modernity that I felt when I was reading it is the fact that the hilarious Nina, who is, uh, you know, at the age of 30, she's on this journey of self-discovery of sorts. Would you say that this is a typical contemporary phenomenon? Do you think there is something about your 30s that drives you on this journey? Yeah, definitely. I think... I think it's something that I personally have felt as well. And like mm -hmm. so much of kind of Nina's journey, as much as it's fiction, is like so inspired by me going on a journey to love myself. 
And like, that's even a phrase I would not have been able to say a few years ago. I would never be able to say like, I love me. I would be so embarrassed. Um, but I've gone on that journey and now I can. And um, I just feel like so many people in their 30s, it's this moment where you're leaving behind kind of like your 20s are allowed to be messy. I feel like there's a bit of like leeway there. But in your 30s, you're kind of like meant to have it sorted. And I think for a lot of people, like, you know, myself included, you're a bit like, okay, I'm 30. Am I where I wanted to be? Um, and not always, but sometimes it's better than what you expected. You know, there's, there's a quote I love about living the life that you have rather than the life you plan. And I feel like that's basically the whole journey that Nina goes on. And I kind of hope it's a journey that's relatable. Um, <laughs> I'm guessing it is. But also, like, yeah. more things, <laughs> like, I just hope it inspires people to go on their own self-love journeys. And, like, I always joke that I basically, instead of just writing a novel, I've kind of written self-help, like, disguised as a novel. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was thinking when I picked up the book, I was like, if I can come away with even half, like let's say 15 things that I love about myself, then this book has definitely succeeded. And I'm close, I'm getting there. I'm definitely getting there. <laughs> and Nina just starts with five and spoiler, she does get to 30, so. <laughs> there we go, we can all do it, we can all do it. And Nell, uh, many of us will of course recognize you from your roles in Outlander and Victoria. So we're so excited that you are taking this journey now um, with your debut novel, uh, Just For Today, which again, another one of the books I've been lucky enough to pick up uh, over the past couple of weeks and absolutely loved. Um, I suppose you could say that your character of, uh, of Joni, she's kind of at a bit of a crossroads and we meet these bunch of amazing characters who are also on a sort of a journey themselves. I wondered what advice would you give to Joni for surviving this confusing modern world if she was your mate? Oh God, that's such a good question. I think to echo what Radhika said, like you're allowed to be a mess in your twenties and that's basically my book. Um, <laughs> to being in a mess in their twenties. Um, I think if I had any advice for Joni, I'd just give her a hug. I think the thing about Joni is that um, she probably wouldn't listen if I said anything anyway. So yeah. I think, yeah, I think with Joni, I just feel such tenderness towards her as I'm sure um, both of these amazing writers here feel towards theirs by the sound of things. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think she'd listen to me. And I think that's not necessarily a bad thing because I think that, you know, she kind of has to go through everything she goes through in the book in order to kind of reach any kind of sense of, um, self-actualization mm -hmm. yeah tenderness I think that is she seems like she's very hard on herself I think anyway that's interesting yeah she probably is she probably is hard on herself I think that you know for me anyway writing her it was fairly it was I, I felt based on my own experience and based on the experience of all of my female friends that that level of uh self-scrutiny is mm -hmm. quite accurate um you know particularly in London I think there's a real thing about kind of being in London and the the chase and the hunger and this feeling of like oh we're all supposed to be doing something amazing and not really knowing what it is yeah absolutely um I think you're, you're oh sorry oh no I thought someone's jumping in my bad my bad uh your three novels they center around three very different women one is a, a savvy student with a, a rational fear in my opinion of situationships and waste men and then we've got one 30 year old woman who's at a crossroads trying to finally really fall in love with herself and then finally we have a 20 something woman coming to terms with the fact that maybe sadly the party has to come to an end at some point which is just so miserable to even think of. Um, but you guys are proof that the female experience is far from monolith. You know, you really, you show that there's so many different experiences that women go through. I'd love to know from all three of you, Bolo, starting with you, how much can you relate to your protagonist's experiences? Um, a lot. And also there's some things in her that I feel are aspirational. For instance, so Kiki is a dark skinned black woman in a, in a predominantly white university. And she's so confident within herself in a way that I wasn't necessarily when I was her age. And so that's why I looked up to her because I really wanted to instill among girls her, her age and older that, you know, it's okay to love ourselves. And she loved herself, herself unapologetically, despite the fact that there's colorism that's touched on in the book, there's racism that's, that's in the book. There's so many things that's got that 
that she goes through but they're not the totality of her and they don't define her own worth and how she sees herself. That isn't to say that she doesn't go through bouts of insecurity, that she doesn't, that she needs to work through, that she doesn't have like chinks in her self-esteem, but still there's just, like I said before, like this underlying knowledge that she's, she, she has worth and, and she deserves love. And that's actually the reason why she's so scared to go into relationships because she's like, I actually really love myself. And I don't want to get hurt. And her whole thing is that, so she has a radio station where she gives romantic advice to the girls on the campus. And um, I love that about her because I'm like, she's like, you know, I don't, I don't want to date, but you know, I'm going to support you guys and you do your thing <laughs> and equip you. Um, and, and I think that's something that I, I hold dear. I think she has a really big heart and, um, and sometimes she's just scared of letting people in. Um, but I think her softness is something that's really aspirational her, how she allows herself to be soft in the book and her, her, her journey towards that point um, is really aspirational to me. But yeah, in terms of like how I relate to her, my confidence now is definitely what I gave to Kiki. So I didn't have the confidence when I was younger, but now me as I am, I'm going through what I went through I, as, a, as a 30 year old, I'm able to give that to Kiki. That's my gift to her. Um, and, you know, people ask me where I have this confidence from. And it's just because it's just like, I've gone through it so much. I'm like, it's such a waste of time and energy um, to not like myself. Like, why would I do that to myself? And it takes up so much energy to take up, to think about what other people think. And I have mm. a very powerful mind. I'd rather put it towards things that are very productive and enrich the world and enrich me. Um, so yeah, I was able to give that to her. Beautiful. I love it. I love it. And what about you, Radhika? Can you can you relate to the personal experiences that Nina goes through in the book? Yeah, quite a lot. <laughs> so I actually wrote the book um, because um, something happened to me that was just so like life changing and funny and crazy that I just really needed to write write it and it sparked the whole book. And it's basically chapter one of the book. Nina starts um, spending a night. In, the whole book starts when Nina spends a night in a cell, like a prison cell. Um, yeah. She gets arrested, and it makes her realize she has to like sit in her loneliness, and it kind of sparks this whole self love journey. And that happened to me um, a few years ago. <laughs> um, I was, it was a Telegraph story that went wrong. I moved to a journalist and I ended up in a jail cell and I just had a breakup and it was the most intense thing ever. I just had to be in this cell completely on my own. Um, and part of it was funny, like I faced the police officers knew everything about my breakup. I was like, I miss Rory, I miss Rory. And anyway. <laughs> um, I eventually like did this whole thing where I went inwards and I started meditating for the first time in my whole life. And I left this prison cell and was like, oh my God, I need to love myself. And that whole moment seemed so like mad that I was like, this is material. Like this, this, I'm saved for this prison thing. And yeah, so that kind of started, that's the beginning of Nina's journey. And from then on, like, it's very much fiction. So it's kind of, it is fiction but so I've put so much of me in there you know not necessarily like actually what happens to her but the emotions of the journey because I just mm. think going on this self-love journey it has these highs and these amazing moments but it's also lonely it's hard and the book goes into stuff about you know mental health like loneliness um and other mental health as well with some characters in the book and it's dark at times as well because you know that is life like it is the combination of all of it um, and my character also gets really badly trolled, which is something that's happened to me quite a lot. Um, and again, it's like, it's interesting getting trolled as a person of color, because you get, and as a woman, you get like all these layers to it that are a bit different, mm -hmm. I think, to, you know, um, other people. And so I just really wanted to explore all of that. And hopefully, yeah, like readers will kind of gain something positive from it. Beautiful. I love it. And now what about yourself? Can you relate to Joni? I definitely can relate to Joni, but yeah. Uh, first of all, I just want to say, I can't wait to read both of your books, ladies. Oh, likewise. So excited. Um, <laughs> um, definitely. Joni began life as me, but within a few short sentences was very much her own person in a really strange way, kind of like what you were saying earlier, Bolu, like how that relationship between the character that you yourself has created somehow becomes externalized and you find yourself talking to them and they talk to you and it's mm. a very weird thing. But she 
she yeah she began life as me and some of the experiences that Joni goes through in the book are experiences that I've been through and I think funnily enough you kind of touched on it earlier to do with uh obviously there's a universality to the story and the fact that she's a woman is kind of incidental but I do think something that is really important to look at about being a woman in your 20s is that self-scrutiny we are so hard on ourselves and it's funny because my book is I suppose in a way maybe I don't know there's parallels but like the flip side of of a, of a self-love thing in that it's about you know she just is so confused about who she is and she's so longing for her life to begin that she doesn't realize that she's already living it um but yeah I think that I think that she despite her beginning life as me she she very much became someone else and is very much in my head and heart kind of frozen where she is in that moment in your 20s where you are just a bit of a mess and I you know I'm now 31 as of two days ago and oh, I feel, birthday. <laughs> thanks. Um, and I feel just really like protective of her and I think protective of all of us in our 20s and what we've all been through beautiful I mean you guys you've you killed it you've killed it I mean honey inspires 30 things I love about myself and just for today are mega I cannot wait for all of our audience to read them as well I can already see that the comments in the chat are going crazy thank you so much guys thank you Leah that was thank great thank you so I believe it's time for panel number two. And this is all very exciting because I'm about to introduce you to three debut authors uh, with three very different stories to tell. Uh, Bobby Palmer, author of Isaac and the Egg, Freya, Freya Berry, the author of The Dictator's Wife, and Moses McKenzie, the author of An Olive in An Olive Grove in Ends. Sorry, my apologies there. And to get a feel of what these guys have to offer, I believe they're gonna start with a reading from each of their books. Bobby, can you do us the honors and kick us off? Yeah, sure. So uh, my book's called Isaac and the Egg, uh, and my reading is from when Isaac, our main character, finds uh, a two foot tall egg uh, in the woods on the worst night of his life. Isaac picks up the egg. It's lighter than he'd expected, softer too. Its exterior isn't hard and cold like the shell of any normal egg. It's soft and wet like a wool of freshly proved dough. A boiled egg. It does indeed feel shelled. But despite the dewy exterior, it radiates an inner heat that could only come from something living. This heat ignites something in Isaac, a latent muscle memory. It feels to his touch less like an egg found on a forest floor and more like a hot water bottle in a fluffy cover. What makes him think of this? Isaac is 29 years old and hasn't had need of a fluffy hot water bottle for at least 20 of those years. Why the intrusion? It's her, of course. It's always her. While Isaac runs hot, it's she who runs, it was she who ran cold. She had a hot water bottle in a fluffy cover. It lay between them in bed. An awful sensation grips Isaac, one he's starting to recognize. It feels as if the forest floor is giving way beneath his feet as if every tree around him has suddenly been wrenched from the ground, as if everything on the whole earth has been flattened except for Isaac, and he's been left with nothing but a wide expanse of nothingness which rips through him with the force of a thousand winter winds off a thousand icy rivers. Imagine all this contained within one body. It starts with a tremor in his gut, as if his stomach has reached the highest point of the upper atmosphere and has nowhere to go but down. Then, with a lurch, down it goes. His heart drops with it. Everything inside him is dropping, his very core collapsing beneath him, and he's struggling to breathe. Gravity is certainly working against Isaac now. In the middle of the clearing, he's too far away from the tree against which he'd steadied himself before. Isaac gasps as if he's drowning, choking as if all of the air has been sucked out of the clearing. He drops to his knees. He does not drop the egg. If anything, he's clutching it harder than before. What am I doing? Isaac asks himself his breath catching in his throat and his blood clotting in his veins. He kneels in a ruined suit in a sodden clearing in a strange wood, cradling an enormous white egg he found on the forest floor, trying his hardest to breathe again. What am I going to do? Bobby, beautifully done, man, beautifully done. Uh, Freya, can we, can we have an extract from The Dictator's Wife, please? Sure, and that sounds brilliant. Thank you, Bobby. Um, 
yeah, so so the dictator's wife is um, uh, about a glamorous, captivating dictator's wife standing trial for her husband's crimes um, and the web of lies she weaves around the young female lawyer defending her. So this is the first description um, of, of the dictator's wife, Maria Popper, uh, and the challenge she faces with the upcoming trial. So they called her the Black Widow after all, said she'd eaten her husband from the inside out, that it was her fault he had become what he had. A man who put on a different $2,000 suit each day and burned it each night in case the fabric was poisoned, who kept a listening room behind his office to spy on ministers and ambassadors, and whose only significant political opponent was discovered shot in the head in a hotel room locked from the inside. Constantin Popper had allegedly embezzled hundreds of millions of dollars, but he was undeniably dead, murdered horribly in the protests of 1989. Instead, it was his widow who turned up at the arraignment, the first step of a trial that would ask how a couple on $20,000 a year could afford mice and porcelain, a bed once slept in by Marie Antoinette, a summer palace, a winter palace, a zoo and a personalized train complete with champagne room and beluga caviar on tap. She arrived to a packed out court, half applauding vigorously, the rest howling insults, a comedy and a tragedy all at once. She bestowed her smile upon them equally, before listening with sphinx-like calm to the charges being read by a fat official. Even when he came to the serious corruption charges, those that carried the death penalty, she did not flinch. 1989 had been and gone. Maria Popper should by now have been in an irrelevance. Yet that slight smile whispered that really she'd been picking her moment all along. Money laundering, fraud, bribery, corruption, obstruction of justice. It was an impressive list. Only when the official finished, slightly out of breath, did she raise her hand? You have not asked me to state my name. The judge rolled his eyes. We know who you are. Do you? A sigh. Go ahead, state your name. Constantin Popper, she said promptly. The court emitted an odd blend of sound, part gasp, part laughter. That is not your name, the fat official exploded. Ah, I apologize. The amber eyes opened wide as mouths. The red lips gave the tiniest smile but you have read out a list of crimes you alleged to have been committed by the executive presidency, which was of course held by my dead husband. I thought you might think I was him. We are perfectly aware that you are not your husband, the judge said impatiently. The eyes widened further. I see, in which case, why am I here? Nice, thank you Freya, thank you so much. And Moses, uh, could we have a little bit from an olive grove in ends please? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for having me. I'll, I'll start reading straight away. Um, An Olive Grove and Ends is about morality and compassion and their relationship with Islam and uh, Christianity. So, <clears throat> there are roads and neighbourhoods like mine all across the country. Broad roads without mansions. In England, they have names like City Road or High Street, except this road was called Stapleton, and those familiar with her charm might call her Stapes. They were broad roads because they trapped their way from one side of ends to the other. Ends was what we called our neighborhood or any neighborhood like ours. I wasn't sure of the reason, whether it was because it was where the downtrodden saw the light at the end of the tunnel or because once you arrived, you only left when those in charge wanted to rebrand. Either way, it was stuffed to the gun wells with people trying to make ends meet, so the name made sense. It was a far cry from Clifton. The moment you left the city center, you could hear or smell ends whether you took a left after Staples or carried straight through Old Market. The sounds were disorderly, it smelt non-white. It was the other side of Abbey Road and industrial waste bins that were padlocked in other neighborhoods hung and stank like open stomachs. You could find a million dreams deferred in the torn slips that littered outside the bookies. I loved and hated this road. It would always have a place in my heart, a certain fondness I kept in acknowledgement of how it shaped the man I had become. I had grown to know Shona right here too, and for that I was truly grateful. Still, I hated it because there was nowhere I was better known, a fact that I would soon come to find more troublesome than I'd ever imagined. And nowhere was there a greater example of how much pain we could normalize as human beings. The road was patrolled by young and old. Up teas arranged tables outside cafes, serving teas from pans. They peered into the face of young hijabis, trying to find a likeness and match daughter to Hoyle. Their sons and nephews stood outside corner shops and met at park benches. And together with my cousins, they were watched by the disapproving eyes of our respective elders. I had more cousins than rivers had rivulets, and like a doting stepmother, Stapes took us all in. 
a few of my aunties had council houses on the offshoots, and I think I had a cousin or two in the high rises that overlooked the toings and throwings of the busy road. Those who didn't live nearby could be found on stapes more often than in their own homes, at nannies in Ladbrokes or one of the yard shops buying cassava and planting. My little cousins might be found at the blue cage playing ball, and the elders might be at one of the free houses tossing dominoes and talking about things they knew nothing about. My cousin Winnie called the street a cell home. She slept on the Baptist church steps and begged cigarette stubs from the gutter. She said she found the gutter more giving than the people passing, but maybe the people passing had nothing left to give. I sailed the pavements in June as one accustomed to the breaks in the concrete. I swayed clear of batting my poles and touched fists with those who knew me well enough to acknowledge me, but not enough to ask how I was. And even if they had asked, I would have lied and said all was well. The end of a dual carriageway split stapes in two. If the first part was Mini Mogadishu or Bentham Hergesa, the second topside was Little Kingston. More bookies, barbers and burger bars, more billboards and men sat low in coops with blackened windows. There was a Pakistani-owned wig shop selling Brazilian hair to West African women. Across the street, their ill-mannered Caribbean competition saw less custom. Further up the road, on the corner of a branching avenue, blue and white police tape cordoned off the footpath where I had taken Cordell's life not two days ago. The attending officers who were stood beside the tape scanned the crowds, looking for admissions of guilt in the dark faces of passing strangers, but I made it impossible for them or anybody else watching to read my trepidation. As ever, there was a bop in my stride and a bounce to my gait, but my mind was split, contorted in a million directions, a few of them fruitful. Nice. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. I mean, the, the comments already are rolling in. I've seen, I think Emma and Zoe both said, my poor bank account already. So job done, guys. My job done already. Um, I'd love to get into your books uh, briefly, if we can. Uh, Bobby, starting with you. You tackle what is arguably the most universal of topics, which is grief. Um, why don't you take us to where Isaac is at the beginning of the novel? Give us a bit of context. So Isaac is totally lost he's um he's he's just lost his wife um he's sort of found himself totally in the middle of nowhere both both physically and uh, and mentally um but i think i think a lot of the themes in the book reach beyond grief and and into sort of masculinity and I, I, it was really interesting listening to the panel before uh, that, that, the conversation about sort of being in your in your 20s and your 30s because I think um Isaac is a very typical man uh what I say in the in the book is the, the cliff edge of 30 he's uh sort of out of touch with a lot of his friends he he finds himself quite lonely he uh doesn't talk about anything serious uh with any of his mates um and when he loses Mary his wife he loses the only person he he could ever talk to and, and it sends him into a real spiral um without giving away too much about what the egg is um it fills a hole for him and it becomes a story about how how a, a modern man can open up and, and sort of what it what it takes to face your own emotions and, and sort of, of of like reveal your own emotions to to another uh, if not another person, then another egg. <laughs> another egg. Nice. I mean, Isaac sounds like a lot of the men in my life, whether that's worrying or not, I suppose that's for, for you to decide. But nice one, Bobby. Thank you so much. And uh, Freya, this uh, the idea of obviously dictators have had their stories told time and time again, whereas the wives, the spouses of these people is kind of un untapped territory. Where did the inspiration come from for the dictator's wife? Yeah, um, so so I was I was used to be a journalist and I was covering the uh, the twenty sixteen US election um, and I was watching sort of Melania Trump from afar um, and that sort of yeah the sort of glamour but also the silence that surrounds her um, and around the same time I dug out this um, twenty eleven article a Vogue cover piece about um, uh, about um, Admiral Assad. Uh, and it's entitled The Rose in the Desert, and it talks about her um, her beautiful red Louboutin shoes and her glamorous outfits. And um, then a month later, the Syrian civil war breaks out. Um, so I was just sort of really interested in how, because so many of these, mostly, I mean, I haven't done a survey, but 
most of these dictators are married or certainly have mm -hmm. relationships um, with, with, with women in their lives. And these women can obviously often be incredibly powerful forces. Um, Romania, which is sort of the basis for the fictional country in my novel, um, the dictator husband wife team um, up until 1989, they were called the conjugal dictatorship. Um, so I'm just really interested in um, the sort of gap between um, how we see women and, and, and how, um, how they actually are, um, you know, how they can whitewash these men or be complicit with them or be terrorized and intimidated by them. Um, and also the spell of, sort of gl that glamour part cast We're so willing to be deceived by appearances. So it just felt like an incredibly rich subject to, 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 to examine this female power and how it's used and abused. It's captivating to read. I mean, I'm already under Maria's spell and I'm just reading it. So thank you so much, Raya. Thank you. And Moses, uh, the character in your book, Seon, in uh, An Olive Grove in Ends, you really get the impression that the phrase, it takes a village, is very much relevant to his experiences. You really present the whole image of the community. Uh, why is it so important for you to portray the, the community and not just a character in isolation? Um, because it would have been untrue to pretend as if he was raised by just one or two people. The environment in which it's set is, is the environment that I'm from, though even within that environment is one of the themes in the book, there are different worlds in that environment. And I um, do not belong in many ways to the same world as Seon, but in terms of the environment, I've lived and seen how someone like him would have been raised. Mm. And, um, and, and it is a village, it is a community. Everything affects you when you leave the house, when you're, when you're in the house. Mm. And, and all of that shapes him into, into who he is. Amazing. Thank you so yeah. much, man. That was kind of a closed answer. No, 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 you're good, man. That's the yeah. way it is, that's the way it is. No, I like it. You're speaking yeah, from experience yeah. as well, it's nice. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I couldn't think Thank of how you. to expand that. I was trying to talk, talk for longer. No, if you've got anything <laughs> else to add, please add. Feel free, this is literally your stage, but if that's all it is, then that's what it is, right? Yeah, yeah that's what it is. Moses, I actually used to uh, to work on Stapleton Road. I grew up in Bristol and- um, Okay. The description of it sounds, um, is, is, is amazingly sort of accurate and poignant. So, yeah. Oh, that's good, that's good. What, um, what part of um, Safe Road? I worked at the GP surgery. I was a receptionist in my gap year. The GP surgery, where's that Charlotte Kill? It's, I think it's literally called Stapleton Road GP or something like that. Okay, so, okay, okay. Go to train station walk. <laughs> that's cool, I'm glad you liked it, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah. Now you've got a tour guide next time you're in town for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much to our debut authors for joining us, Bobby, Freya and Moses. You guys smashed it on the readings and Thank you're you. brilliant. Thank you so much. I mean, we are getting through it. This is good, guys. We're doing well. Um, I'm seeing that people are talking about cancelling Christmas for the sake of buying these books. I'm here for it. I'm absolutely here for it. Um, our next panel for the evening is about real lives and real people. We've got three formidable authors telling very real stories of very real lived experiences. And although there's very little that connects the subject matters of all these three books, they all use memoir to offer a refreshing perspective on humanity and what connects us and what divides us. I'd like to introduce uh, Sabrina Mafuz. Sadia Azmat and Jill Nalda to Headliners 2022. Good evening, ladies. Hiya. Hiya. Are we all here? Is Jill here? Thanks. Yeah, we got Jill. <laughs> See, it's fun and smoothie. We're doing good. Uh, Sabrina, uh, your book, These Bodies of Waters, which is dedicated, which I loved, to the diasporic dreamers, looks at empire through um, a slightly different lens than usual. And what I really found captivating about it was the, the interview style. And I think it adds a, a unique sort of surreal element. Why did you choose this style? Can you tell us a bit about it, please? Um, yeah, sure, thank you. Um, so when I left my postgraduate at UD, um, I went to work for the civil service fast stream scheme at the Ministry of Defence. And as part of that, um, I was having interviews within the job to get um, my clearance um, raised to top secret clearance, which was kind of needed to get to the senior jobs that you're supposed to get to. Um, and uh, with the fast stream scheme. And as part of that, you just had to have these interviews and the interviews um, 
ask a lot of probing questions, which sort of seemed slightly understandable at the time, considering what they were for. Um, but then as the years have gone past, I've kind of looked back on them more um, with uh, a different sort of light, considering the times that we're in and um, considering at the time I was like a girl in my 20s being interviewed quite intensely by an older white man who had very strict ideas of like what a responsible person sort of looked like and lived like. Um, so I was kind of been reflecting on on that and, and how those questions from him specifically, but also just like an amalgamation of people like him have sort of shaped my life and the things that I've found myself being able to do or feel like I can't do um, and how that sort of interview process um, is I thought it was a good way to kind of um, represent colonialism really in, in a way that it kind of acts as if it's asking you questions and inviting you into certain things but but really it's just like assessing what can be taken from you that's that's um, interesting and helpful to the person doing the interviewing. I think it really works in it there certainly are some personal questions my god. <laughs> Uh, Jill, uh, your your book, Love from the Pink Palace, Memoirs of Love, Loss and Cabaret Through the AIDS Crisis is so full of heart. We're so used to stories of the AIDS crisis being one dimensional and that it's just full of sorrow and sadness and suffering. But your story, it takes us into the heart of Soho, into your vibrant friendship group. We've got theatre types, dancers, singers. Definitely the lives and souls of the parties, that's clear. Uh, did this inform your writing when it came to putting pen to paper? Were you sure that you wanted that vibrancy in, in your memoir? Yes, thank you. I was sure because I, I wanted to describe the boys that I knew. I wanted to, to try to make them sort of live through what they were trying to, because they, they were just young men. We were all very young and they were just having their life they were trying to live their life and and you arrived into London in this kind of hedonistic beginning of the 80s and so I think without the vibrancy without what they the colour and the excitement then you you can't really appreciate how life changed and and how the arrival of the HIV virus and then um, AIDS you know changed everybody's life and, and the way it did so I thought that in order to pay tribute properly to the boys uh, which is what I wanted to do throughout the book. Um, obviously, I, I um, have to use it through my own eyes because that's all I, I know and, and how I remember. But without the excitement and the fun, then there is no, there's no picture of the real world there. So that, that's what I'm trying to um, bring, bring out, really, and, and also to pay tribute to them and their memory because they don't want to be remembered as, as victims of AIDS, they were living a life and got struck down by AIDS. So that that's my um, that was what I really wanted to try and do. Beautifully said and beautifully done for sure. Um, Sadia, you are a uh, you're a proud British Indian Muslim woman who is also a self proclaimed you know you're a horny babe and I love that. Um, <laughs> do you get do you ever get fed up of being described as like a walking contradiction when it is simply who you are? <laughs> uh, no it's I don't the thing is people ain't brave enough to describe me as anything so I take I take it as it comes and and you know what I was uh, very excited that there were some men in the um author's uh zoom so perhaps <laughs> it's not perhaps it's not all you know <laughs> wrong I don't know um but yeah no Sex Form is a really fun uh, memoir about me uh finding my feet on the dating scene um or not shall I say and um the comedy scene and yeah so I hate the term coming of age but it, I guess it's a bit isk of that yeah nice I mean I, I'm sorry I forgot to even mention that your book is called Sex Form just such a good title <laughs> tone of where of where we're going and I love it so idea I want to come and see a live stand-up performance from you as well because I just know it's going to be great I know that. it is be, be, be careful if you sit in the front row you know I'm coming for you Leah <laughs> true true I'll be ready I'll be ready now Sabrina you are a you're a poet you're a writer you're a playwright as well it's really hard for me to picture you uh working for the MOD and I hope you don't take that in an offensive way. I just wondered, do you look back at that time 
in your life at all with like any fondness at all in that sort of corporate world? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've never just been doing one thing. So even when I was working there, I was still working in nightclubs on the weekend. Um, so, you know, I talk about that in the book, the sort of the need, really, what I see now as a need at, at the time and for a long time, I justified it as a financial need because that's partly true. But I realised it's also like an emotional need to have different worlds happening at all times because I'm from so many different worlds and I've always found it hard to just belong to one world and feel comfortable with that so um always sort of juggling these seemingly contradictory worlds and just really fighting against that like why does everything have to be a contradiction like your previous uh, question to um Sadia like why why are these things these descriptions these worlds why can't people just be the whole human being that they are and why are we like so obsessed with putting people into these boxes and like labeling them as these particular things which means that they can't also be these other things um so I've tried to actively promote that in the way that I've lived my life so yeah like there's loads of great memories from the MOD I made loads of friends there who all kind of left around the same time as me it was the first year of um the official sort of diversifying the recruitment process so um luckily I was there with like a few people who um were quite on on a level of of my of my level and um yeah interestingly we all kind of left at the same time as well to pursue creative endeavors so I don't know what that tells you but there you go it's telling me something I won't go there it's telling me something. <laughs> Um, so Jill for those of us who were lucky enough to have watched Channel 4's It's a Sin we kind of feel like we already know you but I suppose there is an element of fictional fictionalization with that form of storytelling was it a difficult decision to let the world into the real you into your real story was that a it tricky quite, one it was quite a difficult decision I think for me I just wanted to I didn't want to turn down the chance to tell like not only my story but the story of of everybody that I remember and know so I thought I, I thought that was um a kind of a beautiful chance really so I wanted to try and do that um and it's a sin of course written by Russell so it it's got the you can't get a better writer Russell T Davis already wrote a story but yes he did use his imagination as well so you know there's not not everything in that is based on on me for instance but it's an amalgamation of people that he knew and and everything about the world that he was living because he obviously lived through the AIDS crisis as well so that that was my that was my main intention really I thought well not not to say that it's a sin wasn't true but to add more to give it a, a, an extra dimension to perhaps describe in a bit more detail or perhaps tell things that people uh, wouldn't know about it and also to talk about the the, you know, the, the aspects because it, it, Russell only had five episodes so he couldn't you know you can't cover everything at all in, in a drama and I can't cover absolutely everything in a book but I've gone into as much detail as I can and tried to look down some avenues that I hadn't explored before and and relate it to all those lovely boys that I knew and ones that I, I didn't know but knew about and all sorts of different stories and, and not just that but the other problems that face people like you know women were facing HIV straight men were facing it so it's not it wasn't just I, I've tried to touch into to the world as it was at that time because I think people were surprised very surprised by it's a sin and what that was showing so I've tried to look into um some of the other stuff that was going on as well and, and try to relate it to our lives and, and what was going on so yes it's uh it's 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 tried to be deeper i tried to go a bit deeper for sure yeah. fill out the story a little bit thank you so much Jill. um sadia i mean you don't have to be a genius to know that the modern dating scene is a bit of a minefield please can you tell us your take on the present situation tell us what the UK dating scene is saying from your perspective oh my god <laughs> that's a big question I mean I think it's really hard um I think that uh people are trying and uh I don't think it's as straightforward as it used to be perhaps because I think there's so many options like there's maybe you could argue too many options and I think for that reason um, people tend to keep uh, you know uh, one eye on the app and one eye in real life and so it's like it makes it a bit challenging to commit 
for some people um and yeah it's like dominoes you know you can get stuff ordered to you to your front door so um I think what I like to talk about in the book is is your relationship with yourself is really really important to be able to uh kind of succeed in, in anything really because I think initially to know that you're worth love um and deserve it of love um and also to then be able to recognize that how to treat other people but also if you're being treated the way that you deserve to be so um yeah I mean like I like uh, <laughs> I recently went uh, I was in a gym and there's this really hot guy and um you know I was gonna ask him but then like you know I didn't know you know is it appropriate to ask him out or like does he want to do it by the apps these days and I think it's like a bit of a, a bit of a like yeah a hard one but um everybody each their own some people prefer doing it online I think people tend to be a bit brave online um because they can use all the you know their best pictures and the best lighting <laughs> whereas I think I prefer like real life where you can kind of like there's chemistry uh or you know it's you just know I don't know there's something in in, in kind of being there together so I mean we're all trying to figure it out and it, it's ever-changing um but yeah I think knowing your worth and uh trying to set a certain level of value so that you don't just compromise for anything beautiful that's a nice way to wrap things up I think thank you so much Sadia Mafu is the author of Sex Bomb Sabrina oh my goodness your story These Bodies of Water was incredible and Jill Nalda with uh, Stories from the Pink Palace just sorry Love from the Pink Palace just gorgeous guys thank you so much three memoirs that I needed on the to read list I would say thank, thank you, you so oh my god this list is just getting longer and longer guys it's ridiculous um, now, our next guest, I'm sure you will know Gemma Atkinson as an actress and a radio presenter and from her memorable stint on Strictly Come Dancing. She shares a two-year-old Mia with her fiancé, professional dancer Gorka Marquez, who she famously met on the show. Uh, she's here to tell us about her new book, The Ultimate Body Plan for New Mums, 12 Weeks to Find You Again. And she's got a spe special message for all of us. I'm Gemma Atkinson and my new book is the follow-up from my previous book, The Ultimate Body Plan. This is the ultimate body plan for new mums. So this book is basically about helping mums, whether you're a first-time mum or whether you're a mum to many. It's just helping you find yourself again after the wonderful, crazy world uh, of motherhood, crazy journey into motherhood. The highs, the lows, finding yourself mentally, spiritually, physically, just remembering that you were someone before you were a mum because in turn if you're happy and healthy your little baby will be happy and healthy also so um i hope you enjoy it it means so much to me this book i'm so so proud of it and i hope you guys enjoy it oh thanks Gemma. um so for our penultimate session of the evening uh we will be speaking to melissa Fu, who has written peach blossom spring a story of family migration and the search for a place to belong set over three generations in modern China. And Christina Patterson, the author of Outside the Sky is Blue, an incredibly detailed memoir of love and family and what it's like to be the last ones left. Good evening, Melissa. Good evening, Christina. How are we? Oh, it's been wonderful listening to everyone beforehand. I'm kind of mesmerized by the, just the breadth and depth yeah. of the, the books that are coming out. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Me too, exactly the same. I've, I've been a critic for 30 years, so I can get a bit jaded about books. And frankly, when a, when a jiffy bag, a bulging jiffy bag arrives, it's not always for me a cause for celebration. But this evening, I just feel so excited and inspired and thrilled and overwhelmed, actually, to be on with such incredibly talented people. I read Melissa's book and it is absolutely wonderful, really, really superb. One of the very best debut novels I've ever read. And uh, if you read nobody else's book this evening read melissa's but read, oh, goodness. <laughs> read lots of books <laughs> even your own <laughs> i love it thank you so much guys um melissa uh, you were let's let's talk about peach blossom spring you were lucky enough to hear a, a detailed story of your family history from your father which is something that i'm sure a lot of us would love to experience please do tell us about that afternoon in 1998 when your father told you his story that went on to inspire Peach Blossom Spring. Oh, yes. Well, um, you know, he never told us much growing up. He wouldn't, 
he just, we'd ask him a little bit about China, a little bit about when he was young and maybe one or two funny stories, but usually he would just say, no, nah. no, no, not now. Or we just knew not to ask him, but for some reason, and it was, it was Christmas day, 1998. And maybe my brother asked him something. I don't know. He just said, okay, okay. I'll tell you, ask me anything. So we said, okay, start at the beginning. And, um, and I took notes. In fact, I have them here. I have, now I have them always to hand. And he just, he said, um, that actually one of the very first lines in the book is what he said. He said, my, my grandfather had three wives. He, it's a different name than the one. And so I, I wrote them all down and um, I've got these notes here. <laughs> and he just, there, I, and I carried them with me everywhere for years and years before I became a writer, before I really knew that this is what I was going to write. I just knew it was really important. Um, and uh, I noticed as, as I was working on the book that the very last thing he wrote down is, um, here's my very, very um, <laughs> messy handwriting. You probably can't see it, but he said, that's just an outline. Maybe someday if I'm good, I'll write a novel of it. So that's what he said. So <laughs> I guess that's what I'm here to do. <laughs> Oh, amazing. Oh, you've written like your front to back, like you've really scrolled page after page after page. That's amazing. Yeah, busboy job. As much as I could um, stick into the novel from these notes details, I did, although it is a fictional novel, because even though it's eight pages, it's still not, it's still not a whole life, right? So there was <laughs> a lot to, to make up. So. so precious, obviously, that will be treasured forever. That's amazing. And I mean, unlike, uh, unlike Melissa, Christina, aside from anecdotally, I get the impression that you learned the details of your family history after your parents passed through diaries and letters. Um, what was it like uncovering these stories and did it alter the way that you remembered certain members of your family? Well, that's such a good question. Um, I have to be honest and say, I've wanted to write a version of this book for more than 20 years. My sister uh, was diagnosed with schizophrenia when she had her first breakdown when she was 14. And we didn't know what it was, but uh, her mental illness had a very big impact on our family. And I wanted to write about it for years. And then um, she died very suddenly and very shockingly when she of a heart issue when she was 40. One and then when I started wanting to write this book, everybody was alive. And by the time I wrote it, everybody, including my brother, was dead. So obviously, I didn't. I expect there to be people I could ask, and there isn't anyone I can ask anymore. Uh, so from that point of view, it was strange actually to go through diaries and photos, and also obviously a painful. Most of it. I vaguely remembered, but there were things that, um, for example, about my sister's illness and the effort my parents put in. For example, my mother worked so hard to try to get my sister a job. My sister had a job as a typist, which she absolutely adored, and she was sacked from it. And that night, my father, who was, you know, very English, my mother was Swedish, but my father was, he was actually Scottish, but sort of um, spiritually English. And, um, and uh, my mother just wrote in her diary, John cried, you know, things like that, which I, obviously I didn't know that my dad cried when, when Caroline lost her job. And details like that from letters and diaries just kind of turned, made my heart flip over. Um, but it was, I, I, I sort of felt like I just, I've been through, it was obviously also very time consuming going through all those boxes. And my brother had a whole garage full of stuff, but um, yeah, I feel like something I've needed to do for a long time, I've now done. And in as far as nobody can tell the final story of a family, but I've done my best to tell the story of a, of a very, very lovely family and quite eccentric in their different ways, but all very special. And, you know, we, we were all so different. People would say, how did you pop out of the same womb? I have no idea, to be honest. I mean, it's one of those mysteries of families, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but, but it was, I, I loved it. I, it, was, it was kind of sad, but lovely. I loved doing it. And I'm, I'm just very happy to have written the book. It's incredible. So incredible. What a, what a gift it is as well. 
um, whether it is the, the the beautiful scroll that is mentioned in Peach Blossom Spring, or say, let's say the sentimental jewellery in Outside the Sky is Blue, I'd love to know what your guys' takes are on heirlooms. Like, Melissa, do you think objects and heirlooms are important to hold on to when preserving a family's history? And are you particularly sentimental when it comes to objects? Oh, wow. Um, absolutely. I think that the heirlooms and the and it's they're the small, not necessarily the most um, valuable things. It's it's the small things that are just so precious. Um, sorry about the dog. <laughs> um, so, uh, okay. uh, one of this one of something that my father always had um, that I think he brought over from Taiwan from his mom was a pair of of, of scissors with like they were he used them to cut his nails little D shaped scissors, um, D-shaped handles. And I never saw anyone else with them. And um, when I went, I always knew where they were in the house. And um, when I went back uh, in in uh, January 2019, when he passed away, and we were starting to go through some of his stuff, I saw those scissors and I just, I nicked them. <laughs> so I really <laughs> wanted them. But yeah, sometimes I think an object can, it just holds a lot of memories and it it means a lot to different people and yeah i think everyone has their treasures so yeah it doesn't necessarily have to be the thing that will go for millions at auction does it it can yeah. just be the small things it's beautiful uh christina it must have obviously been challenging uh, writing and revisiting some of your experiences at a young age as it would be for all of us but particularly for yourself um given that you are, as you say, the last one left. Has this experience helped you process events in your past? Would you say, was it cathartic at all? I think I've been sort of mulling it over for so long that it's quite hard to say how cathartic it was. But I mean, I, I, just, it, it, I just loved writing the book. I just loved it. I mean, there was just, in a way, I've never enjoyed, I mean, it's a ridiculous word to use because some of it's very sad, but it just gave me such huge joy to bring those stories together and write about my beloved family, sorry, and kind of try and bring them alive. Or, you know, obviously I can't bring them alive, but, um, Bring them some kind of life and so yes I think there was a, a catharsis there and I, I just wanted to say in response to what you, the question you asked Melissa about heirlooms yes. and so on I mean I've had to check out an awful lot of stuff you know when my when my brother died he he really liked stuff uh, he really liked the family stuff and to be absolutely honest a lot of it was was really hideous I, mean, I don't know <laughs> when my, my when my mother came over from Sweden um to this country she had you know really great taste it was all kind of clean Scandinavian lines and then you know over the years she accumulated all this kind of lacquered pine furniture and you know sort of <laughs> it was all kind of pretty awful and I'm so glad that nobody told her that when the house when the contents of the house were valued after she died that I think it was all worth 270 pounds and I thought my poor mother she oh. had a problem. she'd written down everything where everything came from all these things they lived in Bangkok she had sort of lovely stuff from Bangkok and from Rome and it was worth basically nothing but um I just think that stuff you know that stuff doesn't really matter but photographs and letters and diaries and things like that these whenever I I'm on Sky News a couple of times a month and whenever I'm on people the only reason I sit in this corner is because it's the only place there aren't kind of weird lights there are these albums and people always say oh are those your files and it's like no I'm way too disorganized to put anything of mine in a file all my stuff is lying around in boxes but these are my mother's photo albums behind me and she just had hundreds of them so and I didn't keep all of them but you know things like photos that kind of stuff I think matters amazing look how many there are that's incredible that's a real treasure trove that you've got behind you there um I wondered if you guys would do us the honor of giving us a short reading from you both if that's something that you have you're able to do Melissa could you kick us off sure so um I'm going to read um from when uh the mother character Melin first introduces her son Renshu to the scroll which um which Leah referred to, there's this uh, 
Chinese hand scroll that they carry throughout their travels across China with lots of stories on it. And um, they, Meilin tells stories to really comfort uh, Renchu, maybe make him laugh, maybe a small lesson. So this is a little, this isn't the hand scroll behind me, it's a hanging scroll, but it's kind of of that style. Although hers is, because it's imaginary, it's, you know, as elaborate as I want it to be with beautiful colors. So this is what Renchu first sees it. Um, she's just given him uh, the box to open. She invites Renshu to open the box. Inside is a scroll. Oh, I should say he's about, he's about four years old right now, three or four years old, so he's, he's very little. Renshu lifts it up. He loosens the tassel. Meilin leans forward to help him lay it flat on the table. When the first scene is fully revealed, she places one hand on his to stop him unrolling it any further. Her other hovers over the columns of characters as she reads aloud. This, she tells him, is a story of traveling scholars. Here they start with strong legs and bright eyes. They will follow the river and the sun. Renshu prods Meilin. He wants to see more. As he unrolls the next scene, Meilin rolls up the section they have just read. Once more, she stays his hand when the full scene is revealed. Again, she reads the poetry, conducting its music and story. And for the rest of the afternoon, they journey through the scroll, scene by scene, discovering details and making up stories. Guiding Renshu, she shows him her favorite parts. Here, the tiger sleeps and the travelers pass without harm. There, in the crowded market, the cleverest scholar wins a game of chance and wit. On narrow bridges over mountain streams, travelers contemplate the constancy of ever-flowing motion. Renshu, whispers Meilin, have you noticed that none of the travelers face backwards? They move forwards through the landscapes and never look back. Oh, thank you so much, Melissa. Beautiful. And Christina, would you do us the honors? I'd rather read Melissa's, actually. It's <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> It was my mother who taught me to believe in magic. Every Christmas, when we made peppercalkur or ate the ones we she bought from the Christmas market at the Swedish church, she reminded us that you had to take one and place it in the palm of your hand and press it. If it broke into three pieces, you got a wish. Once I asked her if the wish, if the wish really would come true. She was silent for a moment. And then she said that if, for example, you were ill, you would get better. Years later, when I was ill, I remembered that. It was true. That time it was true. In a box in Tom, my brother was called Tom, in a box in Tom's hall cupboard, I found the old Christmas decorations. For years we moaned because we wanted shiny baubles like the ones on our friends' Christmas trees and colored lights and tinsel. We had boring white lights and our decorations were made of wood and straw. There was no fairy at the top of the tree, but a big straw star. There were no big fat Santas, just the Tomton, Santa's little helpers made out of wisps of red wool. In the box, I find the Tomton and some little wooden stars. At the bottom of the box, I find the old straw star, but its points have nearly all been broken off. And I find some woven hearts. Yes, in my brother's hall cupboard, I really do find a box of hearts. The candles started at Advent. We always, always lit candles for Advent. I still like candles for Advent. My Christmas decorations are like the ones I grew up with. They are made of straw and felt and wisps of red wool. I could no more swap them for baubles and tinsel than rip out my tendons or change my blood. But the big day for candles was St. Lucia. That was 12 days before Christmas on the 13th of December. It was a festival of light, my mother said, when the eldest daughter of the house was meant to wake the family up in a long white dress and a crown of candles. She had to sing the Lucia song and carry the tray with the coffee and cakes. They were lussacatter, the saffron buns my father said were too dry, and pepperkaka, ready for us all to snap and eat. 
In the early years, Caroline and I both wore white nighties and tinsel in our hair, and Tom wore a pointy hat with gold stars like a wizard. Mm. One year, Auntie Lisbeth sent us a proper Lucia crown. It didn't have real candles like the ones my mother had when she was a girl, but the candles looked quite real. And when you twisted each little circle of plastic, a glass flame flickered into life. Caroline didn't want to wear the crown, so I wore it. When I put the flickering circle of light on my head, for a moment I felt like Cinderella when she finds the shoe fits. I never really knew the words of the Lucia song, but I pretended to sing them anyway. The song, in the translation I found, talks about the shadows brooding in our dark house. Then Santa Lucia arrives on the doorstep wearing white and a crown of light. Darkness, the song ends, shall take flight soon, and a new day will rise again from the rosy sky. I believe that. After everything, I believe that. I really do. What a beautiful festive note for us to wrap things up on, Christina. That is stunning. Thank you so much to you both for joining us and for sharing these snippets of your, of your beautiful stories. Thank you so, so much, guys. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. And uh, finally, we are now going to hear from a best-selling author, Patrick Gale, all the way from Cornwall, who is here to introduce his upcoming novel, Mother's Boy. Hello, this is Patrick Gale talking to you from his extremely sunny garden in the far west of Cornwall. I'm here to encourage you to pick up a copy of my new novel, Mother's Boy, which comes out on the 1st of March next year. It's historical, so it will press the same buttons, I hope, as A Place Called Winter. It also has quite a bit in common with my Emmy-winning teledrama, Man in the Orange Shirt. It's about the early life of the great Cornish poet Charles Causley and his extraordinary and unsung mother, Laura, who pretty much raised him on her own. It's really the story of how a poet becomes a poet. Charles has all manner of adventures, as does Laura, and he goes away to war and becomes a coder and discovers himself. But then there's this great mystery in his life as to why he, after all these great adventures, chooses to come back to the little Cornish town where he was raised, teach in a local primary school and live with his mother in a, a tiny two up, two down cottage. You will find out all in Mother's Boy. I really hope you enjoy it. Thank you. The wonderful Patrick Gale there, Mother's Boy. So thank you oh so much for everybody for getting involved, for all of your comments. I think I'm agreed with you. I mean, RIP, our bank accounts, we're screwed, but it's gonna be worth it, worth every single penny because we have some amazing books. Thank you so much to all of our incredible authors, from the debut authors to the season favorites. It's just, it's incredible. Thank you so much for joining us and for doing your bit to support the Arts, Arts Emergency Fund. And a big thank you to our sponsors, Serious Pig and Fentiman's Lemonade for helping all of this happen. Take care, happy Christmas, happy new year, if I don't see you before and have a great one guys. Thank you so much. Club isn't the best place to find the lovers of the bar is where I go. Mm -hmm. Me and my friends at the table.